that debate was really settled in a way by Newton in Principia with the bucket experiment. So maybe people know about this. I often say this could be, you could argue, was the single most important experiment in the history of physics. Really? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I would say it's between that and, 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 or you could say if we get to general relativity, it was uh, Galileo's experiment dropping a heavy and a light ball off of a building and finding that they fall together, okay? But the, the, the one, I think the most important experiment, because here you have this big debate that looks like a philosophical debate or metaphysical debate or something like that. What is the fundamental nature of space and time? So you have questions like, is the following thing metaphysically possible, that you annihilate all the matter but space and time still remain? And if you think space and time are nothing but relations between matter, the answer is no. You get rid of the matter, then there are no relations between matter, then space and time themselves are gone. And Newton, from the beginning in, in his scolium on space and time, is very carefully and beautifully arguing, no, space and time, absolute space and time exist. They're different everyday, in everyday life we don't talk about them. In everyday life we talk about relative space and time and relative motion. But there also has to be this absolute space and time and absolute motion. So again, if anybody hasn't read it, go read Newton's Scolium on Space and Time. It comes after definition eight in the Principia. And you can just read it. It's like, you know, it's absolutely clear. Newton, like Einstein, like Bell, very clear thinker, very clear conceptual thinker. He understands what his physics needs. And he gives you arguments for why you need it. So Leibniz, again, you just set them up. Newton says, even without any material bodies, space and time exist, absolute space and time exist. They support the notion of absolute motion. Leibniz says, no, space and time are just ways of talking about relative positions of bodies. Take away the bodies, there's nothing. Now, how does this get resolved? Not by a philosophical argument. It gets, it gets resolved by an experiment. Um, really, Newton is arguing directly against Descartes and, 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 and Aristotle there. But Newton just says, again, if people don't know, do this experiment. And the nice thing about it is you can call it a thought experiment, but I do it in the class. I mean, it's an experiment. You can just do it. It's easy to do. The reason you think you don't have to do it is that you know how it's going to come out. But it's not a thought experiment in the way that, you know, things you can't actually do and you say, but if we were to, I mean, you can just do it, right? Go, just need a bucket, <laughs> need a bucket and some water and a rope. Yeah. Um, and so Newton says, look, according to, especially Descartes, and, and you can get this Descartes following on, on Aristotle, uh, the motion that appears in physics when you say something is moving is, is again, like Leibniz, it's relative motion, but it's in particular the relative motion of a body to the surrounding body, to the body immediately next to it, right? So uh, to take a standard example, um, well, Galileo talks about being in a ship that's on a calm sea, sailing on a calm sea. Uh, and, and doing experiments in the body of this ship. And he you know, points out, and again, this is an observation. You can't tell from those experiments whether the ship is, is anchored in the harbor or sailing, as long as it's calm and it's not, and the, and the ship's sailing straight. Um, and, and all the phenomena will be the same. He talks about you've got butterflies flying around and water dripping down, and it'll all look the same. So are you moving or not? Suppose the ship is under sail, as it were, and you're down there and you say, are you moving or not? Now, one thing to say, that, that you can say is, look, the relevant motion is just the relative motion of you to the, your immediate surroundings. And because if you're just sitting in your chair, you're not moving, right? Right. Um, and so that's, Th that was this idea that relative motion is physical motion. Now, Newton says, oh yeah, you think so? Because it's very important for Galileo, and Galileo says this, he doesn't make that much, 
point of it, but he says it. He says that when that ship is under sail, it has to be on calm seas. It, it, can't be, it can't be tipping this way and that way, and you can't be turning the boat. If you do that, then you will notice, even though you're in the body of the ship and you can't look out, right? You can't track your relative motion with respect to anything outside you, but you'll notice inside. So Newton says, look, here's the experiment. Take a bucket of water, fill it up, tie it to a rope to the ceiling, and twist the rope very strongly. And imagine, so in the beginning, I've just got this bucket of water. And here's something you can see, because we're worried about what you can observe. The surface of the water is flat. Now, very quickly, spin the bucket and let it unwind. You imagine it unwinding with this. And Newton says, well, immediately after you do that, the bucket will start spinning relative to the water. Right now, you've got the water and the bucket is spinning. Uh, as I like to say, you can imagine yourself, you're an ant floating on a leaf inside the bucket. Now you notice that the, the handles of the bucket are doing this around you. So think of phase one is, at the beginning, the water and the bucket are at relative rest. So if you're the ant, you don't see this. And the surface of the water is flat. Let, it, let, let go of it. In phase two, now they're in relative motion. But the water's still flat. And then if you wait a while, eventually, and you, you can picture this in your head, as we would say, the water picks up the spin from the bucket, starts going around with the bucket. Eventually, now there's, they're at relative rest. If you're, you're, again, if you're the ant, you look up at the handle, it's not doing anything, but the water is now like this. The water is now concave. And then in, that's phase three. In phase four, the bucket, as it were, comes to rest in the room and the water's still doing this. So the, the, now there's relative motion again and the water is concave. And what Newton points out is, look, there's a clear physical effect here. Sometimes the water's flat and sometimes it's doing this. That's not because of the relative motion of the water in the bucket, because there's no correlation there. Sometimes when the water is at rest with respect to the bucket, the water, it's like this, and sometimes it's like this. Sometimes when it's spinning with respect to the bucket, it's like this, and it's like this. So the relative motion of the water to its container cannot give you the physical explanation of this effect. And what Descartes had been arguing is that it is that relative motion that is physical motion. And Newton said, no, can't be right. You lose, right, Descartes. <laughs> you know, you lose. And he gives other arguments. And then you might say, well, maybe it's, so again, you, you know, off the top of your head, you'd say, look, it's easy to understand. The water's flat when it's not spinning, and it's concave when it is spinning. And then you say, yeah, but spinning relative to what? If you think all motion is relative motion of bodies, spinning relative to what? It's not spinning relative to the bucket. And then you say, well, maybe it's spinning relative to the room. And now you could kind of imagine doing the same thing. Sit the bucket and spin the room around it, right? That won't change anything. It, it can't be, well, maybe relative to the surface of the Earth. That can't be right, because there's obvious observable effects of the spinning of the Earth itself, like the Coriolis forces that give rise to, to uh, hurricanes going this way in the northern hemisphere and that way in the southern hemisphere. And the fact that the, the Earth itself is oblate, right? It's the equator is sticking out. Why? Because the Earth is spinning. Spinning relative to what? Right? As soon as you say that, you say there are physical effects of spinning. Spinning is a kind of motion. Well, if you think all motion is relative motion. Now, Newton, at the end of the scolium, takes this all the way to the end to a real thought experiment. He says, Suppose the universe only contained, the only matter in the entire universe was two spheres tied together by a cord. He said, if that system, and that's all the matter there is, if that system were rotating, were spinning around its center of mass, you'd have tension in the cord. And the faster it's spinning, the more tension. And you could even tell that it was spinning, even though there's no relative, and there's no relative motion at all of the matter. You could tell it was spinning from the tension. And if you measured the tension, you could tell how fast it was spinning. 
So Newton has these really powerful arguments that you can't understand the motion that accounts for physical effects as merely the relative motion of matter. The, the key from Newton's perspective, if, if we look back on it, is that when Galileo gives his argument about the ship, his argument is, look, you can't, you can't tell by experiment whether the ship is anchored or moving, assuming it's moving smoothly. So that suggests, well, maybe there's no physical difference there. But you can tell whether the ship is spinning <laughs> or not. And the difference is, of course, spinning is an acceleration. And, 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 and the central equation of Newton's physics is F equals ma. So, you, so it's very different if you're talking about an accelerated or an unaccelerated motion. You know, this is, I mean, everything you're saying is amazing, but this is a time where maybe a, a simple clarificatory question yeah. would, would help. Yeah, yeah. Why is spinning acceleration? I don't, I'm not sure that would be clear to everyone. It's sure. Certain, so, certain. yeah, I mean, there are two kinds of acceleration intuitively, the way you learn this initially. Um, one is like when you're stopped at a stoplight and you put your foot on the gas and you feel pushed back in the car because, as you would say, you, you're going faster and faster. So an acceleration is a change in your velocity. And your velocity intuitively can change in two quite different ways. You can keep going in the same direction, but faster or slower. That's the kind of acceleration that puts you forward and back in the car. Or you can keep the same speed, but change your direction. When you're spinning a uniform circular motion, your velocity, your speed isn't changing as it were, but your velocity is, because the velocity includes the direction. And so th this was Newton's key to coming up with his gravitational theory. I mean, this is the whole story about the apple and everything else. Newton says, wait, the moon, for example, is going around the Earth, right? It's orbiting. And the Earth is orbiting the sun. Those are accelerations because they're constantly changing their direction. By F equals ma, there's an A, this is an acceleration, there has to be a force. And for uniform circular motion, the force has to be a centripetal force. It, it has to be directed toward the center, right? Center seeking. So there must be a force that's keeping the moon in orbit. There must be a force that's keeping the Earth-Moon system in orbit around the sun. And it has to be a force directed toward the center of that motion. So for the moon, a force directed toward the center of the Earth. And for the Earth-Moon system, a force directed right at the sun. And then uh, he, he makes various arguments as to, uh, as to the nature of the, that force according to his own physics, that, that it has to be an inverse square force and so on. And then Newton does this wonderful thing. He says, okay, if I'm right, then we can figure out what would happen if we did the following thing. The moon's up there orbiting the Earth. Stop it. Okay, stop that orbital motion, and furthermore, pull the moon down right to the surface of the Earth here, and drop it. So this is like Galileo. By what I've calculated, it would fall at the same speed as an apple. So this is like the, the, the ultimate version of Galileo's experiment with the heavy and the light object. The moon would fall at the same rate. That's the whole deal with the apple. He says, oh, I see, the very same force that causes the apple to fall is the, earth, is the force that's keeping the moon in orbit and the force that's keeping the Earth-Moon system in orbit around the sun and all the other planets in orbit around the sun. I mean, this was the point where Newton destroys the traditional distinction between terrestrial physics, the physics of things on Earth, and celestial physics. I mean, that's built into Aristotle. On Earth, things are made of earth, air, fire, and water, and their natural motion is either down or up. And in the heavens, they're made out of ether, and their natural motion is circular motion, right? So if, if, you, ask, if you asked Aristotle, of course, he thought the sun was going around the Earth, but it's still kind of a circular motion. Why does it do that? Aristotle's answer is, oh, that's the nature of ether. That's just what ether does. It goes in uniform circular motions. And what Newton says is no, I mean, everything's natural motion, that is the motion it'll engage in if nothing is affecting it, is uniform linear motion. 
That's the, the second law. Um, so it's puzzling that the Earth is orbiting the sun. It's puzzling that the moon is orbiting the Earth. We need a force for it to do that. And so he has the universal force of gravity, and he unifies celestial mechanics with terrestrial mechanics. Galileo had taken steps in that direction, but he didn't get there. And Newton finally gives you this theory.